Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 38. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Thank you so much again to all those people who have uh, made some donations to us this week over the past week on our through our website. If you'd like to do that, if you enjoy what we're doing, would like to see us improve our connection, which is the first thing we want to do, uh, and fund some of the other things that we're trying to achieve in education and elsewhere. If you check um, last week's video, which was 37, Gavin talks a little bit more about that, um, then you can visit www.catholicunscripted.com scroll down and then you'll just see support our cause and put in any amount you like but anything no matter how small or big very much appreciated once again and thank you very can much I, this can i add, can sorry, I add something yes. yeah well it's just that i think as people will see from what we're about to talk talk about um the civil war both in society but also tragically within the catholic church uh, is intensifying and one of the reasons we've come together is that because it's particularly intense in education and what we want to do is to make ourselves available to schools uh, to be able to give teachers, head teachers, and governors the information they need to be able to resist this. We're really quite good at this. We, um, The three of us have had some fairly serious professional experience in education. Um, but to do that, we, 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 it, it simply requires a certain amount of finance to do it. Um, so the, the two things we need it for is to allow us to uh, to take those initiatives, everything from, from, from travel to paying the bills, uh, and, and the fact is that the equipment we use is homespun and in most of our, our in all the three of us, it's, it's pretty, Mark has only just upgraded from an iPad. <laughs> um, but but both in terms of access to the internet and the equipment we use, we're, we're doing this on a shoestring. Uh, and therefore we'll be extremely grateful for any help so that we can provide a more solid platform, both infrastructurally and to allow us to do the things we think God is asking us to do. We're not blackmailing anyone by saying God wants it, but all the evidence so far is what we've done has been blessed and there's much more of it to be done if we can only find ourselves in a position to bring it about. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And I hope you're all enjoying the new um, Mark Lambert who comes to you clearer <laughs> this afternoon or this morning or whenever you're watching. For us, it's early evening as we record. Um, but that's just an example of what uh, what we hope to do, which is much clearer output and uh, it, both sound and quality of vision. Well, here we are again. Lovely to be with you both. We we were together this week at the Catholic Herald drinks, which was lovely. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a video or a picture together. We really should have done that. Uh, there's there's pictures of me and Mark, but not of the three of us, which is a shame. So uh, next time we're out and about, we'll try and do a little live recording to share with you all. Um, I was but... sure we took one. I was sure one of us <laughs> took one at some point. <laughs> I haven't got one. Um, well, there we go. It'll have to wait till next time. This week, then, we've had the release of a fantastic letter, I think, from, uh, we all think, uh, from Archbishop John Wilson, who is uh, Bishop of Southwark, which is my diocese. And we'll begin, perhaps, by talking about that. And just today, uh, before we recorded, we heard the news that um, Bishop Strickland has been moved from his post. He um, has been replaced. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And also the fixing of the conclave, which Gavin has written about. So a few things there to get through, but perhaps we'll start with Archbishop John Wilson, who has issued this wonderful letter. Mark, can you tell us a little more about that? It's a, a, a letter which reflects on in light of the Synod. Um, and I think it's interesting that at first glance, you might think, oh, my goodness me, he's gone full Francis. But uh, Gavin, a little bit of, Gavin uh, did. Gavin did think it, and yeah, it required it, it required <laughs> a careful reading by Mark to say, Gavin, you've got <laughs> the wrong end of the stick. But it, but it's it, but it's more. It is very important because, as Mark will explain in a second, forgive my interruption. The letter that was designed to fool casual people like me, speed reading, but it it contained in its tail a totally different message. So so there are two good news. One is that the Archbishop of Southwark set out to provide a, a fairly complex and sophisticated letter saying appearing to say one thing but actually saying something much better <clears throat> and the other is that mark discovered it by reading the text properly it, it might be worth my um just pulling out a couple of quotes it's a nine page letter so do read it and i'll link it here um we have here to be clear the census fide is not a mechanism for deciding the church's faith rather it describes how the catholic faith which has been handed on to members of the body of christ down the ages is received understood and lived by God's holy people. It operates through the faithful who are full of faith, 
who form part of the living tradition and communion of the church's life, united with all those who have gone before us in faith. There is, excuse me, there is divergence for some in understanding or accepting what binds us in faith and how we interpret the truth authentically. The synodal process has created a climate of expectation. Some people look for radical change in church's teaching on specific issues. Others want a more participatory approach to ecclesial ministry. As we discern what this means, we cannot dislocate truth from love or love from truth. The Lord Jesus meets us where we are, but loves us too much to leave us there. Very, very good letter. So, Mark, back to you. Well, I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And what he does, it seems to me, is he uses Francis C's <laughs> to um, sort of take all the power away from um, Francis, which, let's face it, isn't very difficult because the problem that we've got coming out of the Synod is very much, I think anyone who's been trained in theology at all would have a little look at it and say that the, the theology is all very much horizontal. There's no vertical dimension at all to anything really that they've mentioned, um, which is extremely frustrating. And it leaves you wondering, where are they going? What are the, What is the message of this? You know, we know what the message of the gospel is. We know what we're supposed to be doing. And what is the message of the synod? There doesn't seem to be one except just keep on keeping on, keep on talking. Um, and we're paying for it. It's uh, It was revealed in the pillar that uh, basically the people who are paying for it is us through our diocese. So that's great, isn't it? Um, it doesn't really chime very well with the um, ecological message from Pope Francis that these people have got to go all the way to Rome for a week-long session of talking about who knows what really talking about talking and not really achieving anything and not coming out with any answers about what it is the other thing so there are and there are numerous sort of things that are problematic in it one of them is this is the census fide which was dealt with really really well in that passage you just read out and i think that what really interestingly my parish priest who doesn't really ever read anything that i sent him did read that and came back with that point he said it's really good on the census fide so that is a really, really good point. But if they're talking about, you know, dialogue and all this stuff that they're meant to be talking about, like walking together and all this sort of thing, how it doesn't make any sense that it is sort of this bottleneck. So we've had the consultation period where you've got less than 1% of Catholics responding. And then and now you've got a bottleneck, which is that everything goes through the synod on synodality, which is a secret synod. We're all walking together and discussing everything, but we're doing it secretly. No one can know. The people of God are going to tell us what we should be believing, but they're not allowed to know what it is that's being discussed because that's all top secret. So, and, and the, you know, when the journalists aren't allowed to know. And the people basically who are deciding everything is about 350 people or something like that. Um, and they they include people other than bishops so you've got where's the um where's their responsibility is one of the questions that i'd ask you know the point of having bishops making this decision is that they've got the responsibility but there was some guy 19 year old guy from michigan or whatever james martin wrote in america magazine oh it was wonderful to see the archbishop talking to this 19 year old mm -hmm. was he never talked to a 19 year old before you know i thought that was all a load of old rubbish so anyway the whole thing was a load of old rubbish but then you've got wilson who was there comes out and Wilson has built this reputation of being um, a, like quite impressive as Archbishop of Southwark. And here we have him writing a letter in excellent Francisese, um, using all the key Francis language and talking points and saying using it to say Catholic stuff and to reinforce what the church teaches. I think a really good example was compared to the People of God letter, which the Synod re released, um, Wilson mentions Christ 14 times in that seven page letter, whereas in the 41 pages of the people of God letter, Christ is only mentioned 11 times. And I think that's a sort of statistic that shows us what we're dealing with here. Yeah. If we sum up what the issues are, one of the things that the Pope did was to announce a new theological mandate. Um, I forgot. he I think he opened a, a, a theological. Um, it was a most appropriate proprio for a, for a theological enterprise. But essentially what he said was that we're announcing a new theological paradigm. And what that means, these are all code words, and the theological paradigm means we're going to refer to the social sciences to tell us what the truth is, the truth about sexuality. Um, what Archbishop uh, Wilson did was to say, 
we're not going to leave people where they are. We're going to invite them to repent. And these are the two differences. So the, the, the Pope and the Synod are saying, we're going to let the social sciences tell us what the morals of sexuality are. And John Wilson and others are quite rightly saying, no, we're not going to leave people where they are. We're going to put them into the hands of Christ, and then we're going to ask him to change them. So it's all about whether contemporary culture changes the church and Christ's teaching, whether yeah. Christ changes the contemporary culture and the church's teaching. Those are the two sides in this civil war. We're, we're obviously on the side of serving our Lord and the magisterium and scripture. But that's but that's what the secret synod is, is all about. And if only he'd leave it to the scientists to explain about the weather. But he seems very <laughs> intent on talking to <laughs> us about the weather. He knows all about the weather. He just doesn't know anything about Christian anthropology. And that, I think that's one of the main points is that this this whole thing has revealed to us, Gavin, wouldn't you say, that it's the deconstruction of Christian anthropology. And specifically, it's the deconstruction of the Christian anthropology, the Christocentric basis of the Second Vatican Council, you know, was a Christocentric anthropology. And what is he doing here? He's replacing it with a shallow, secular anthropology that doesn't seem to mean anything at all. Well, the last 50 years, um, the social scientists and the psychologists and the biologists have all been um, busy working along the way to see if they can find a gay gene. Because the whole point about trying to change uh, the society's teaching on sex would be, well, if only we can find, we can prove it that people are born gay, or even that we know what being gay is. Um, and, and the problem they've been faced so much of the time is that people actually change. Uh, so sex sexuality is much more fluid, just as they say, but it's fluid both ways, not only one way. And what the science has done is the scientist says, we, we actually don't understand this at all. We don't have a mechanism. We don't have a description. So th th just at the time when the social scientists and the biologists and the psychologists have said, we don't have any language to give you an objective description of people's sexuality, the church comes along and says, we're going to refer to the scientists now, as if this conversation hadn't taken place and as if they hadn't been completely stuffed and stymied by it. All the activists gave up about five or ten years ago when they realised that the scientists were not going to tell them what they wanted to hear. It's just ludicrous to hear the synod say, uh, we're going to refer to the... We, we can't ask these questions in the way they've always been asked in the past because there's new knowledge and new information about sexuality. No, there really isn't at all. And the ethical questions are remain exactly what they were. It's, it's, it's continence and marriage against incontinence and non-marriage. And that's why it's terrible for the church to choose incontinence and non-marriage, which mm. is what the secret synod was intended to come up with. Mm. And it will always be that that that... that... The um, Archbishop's letter also reminds us that not everybody was prepared to repent and uh, listen to Christ. And love, being love, does not force itself. And so it's always it's always a choice. So he gives the example of the rich young man who had to walk away, who who refused. So of so of course we reach out to the margins. We extend love, the hand of love, always in truth, and hope that everybody chooses truth. But not all will. And I think that's just something we have to accept. And that's well explained in, in Archbishop John's letter. Thanks be to God. Like, I, that's what, when you read something like that, you just think, thanks mm. be to God that there are bishops out there who are willing to teach the faith. Mm. And when you read it, that's what you get from it is the faith. And unfortunately, yeah. the theology that's come out of the synod seems to understand sin as some kind of intractable wound whose perdurance is unresolvable and impervious to grace. That's what really bothers me, is that these people seem to think that this wound is impervious to grace, to the extent where we have no alternative but to accept these people, you know, exactly where they are. It, but it's worse it, than that, Mark. I mean, you're right, that it is that. But it's worse than that, because they say it's not sin. I mean, they've, they've moved away from the language of sin altogether, and instead, they're using the language of alienation and accompaniment. So if you are committed to yeah. a position that the church <laughs> says is suboptimal ethically, instead of being asked to change your position and to aspire to a different way of living, as we all do, um, take this out of sex and turn it into pride, for example, or greed. And the fact is, we're all subject to pride and greed and, uh, and, and, and other sins. And when we fail... We repent and we say sorry, we confess our sins, we receive absolution and we try again. And it's a very, very long, laborious process crawling to heaven. But that's the process. The problem with the synodal way 
is that it's changed that process into therapy. And it simply says it's the church's duty to stop, make you stop feeling uncomfortable and to allow you to come on your own terms and stay there. And that's that's the, that's the, the abominable thing at the heart of this, which changes the Christian faith. And doesn't love people. Um, it's no, it's selling them short. This is the thing. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't offer them anything. Um, I don't I don't know about you, but I've been in masses where uh, well, I haven't returned, but to, to, with priests who who don't mention the word sin, they they skirt around the word sin and and talk uh, about um, let's reflect on the difficulties in life and you know some faults that and you can you can see they're desperately trying to reach for words that don't say sin and i think we need to go to mass we need to hear this from our priests and we need our young children to hear this too we are sinners we we don't need god if we can't acknowledge our in sinfulness something i learned from baptists is that is that that? (laughs) sorry that the way that they without any of this wonderful doctrine that we've got so we are everything we've got the tools at our disposal are so much richer and so much more valuable and yet they can read scripture and feel convicted in the spirit that's the way they say you know that they feel the guilt that they recognize their sin they recognize the truth of the scriptures or the truth of the gospel isn't that a powerful thing and that what i'm saying is that's like just the basic thing you know that's just the basic basic christianity you know the very fundamental thing uh, you're sat there with a the bible and you're reading the words of jesus and you feel convicted in the spirit so to take that out that out of it what is the change where is the efficacy all of a sudden the cross is robbed of its power isn't it yeah. and there's there's no point in being a christian because it doesn't you know you can just bumble on as you are without any sort of change and it doesn't make any difference yeah i think that's that at the heart of it and we've spoken about this ever since we met many years ago which is what ultimately the question is what is the point what is the purpose what's the point of the church what was the point of you know what is the purpose of our lives exactly right this is what what why what does christianity mean then what are you offering people that the culture isn't already giving them so this is their intention of what they're trying to do they're trying to change the church to make it a vehicle of of indulgent culture but what's the strategy and that's what I mean. That's that's going to take us to this next thing. I think which we might talk about, which is the rigging of the conclave. Is it is it time to move on to that, Catherine? Yes, uh, I, it is time to move on to that. I just want to mention because I, while I remember it, um, this fantastic article in one Peter five by Peter Kaznicki. Kaznicki, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gavin. Um, which really deals with this question. It was in response to Rod Dreher. Uh, and it deals with this question that people raise, which is, um, if you are critical of the Pope, are you really just a Protestant like Luther? And he goes on to talk about how Luther moved from opposing Pope's vices to opposing the papacy as such and the church fathers and so on. So it's a really good article, which I'll share here, which um, reminds us that actually it's it's not it's not Protestant to discuss as we're discussing and try to understand um the challenges that we face in our church, especially when they come from uh, our Holy Father. So I'll share that then. F- um, F- Father Gavin. <laughs> um, yes. So, so you've written about fixing the conclave. Tell us about that. Well, if we're right about the synod, and we are, um, uh, not because we are particularly clever, but because... We've looked into it. It's so bleeding obvious at this point. It's so bleeding <laughs> yeah. obvious. Thank, thank you, Mark. Yeah. I, was, I was lost for words. <laughs> it was the word bleeding I needed. <laughs> um, then the question is, everything that the, the Pope has done depends upon him having a successor elected who won't turn back what he's done and won't recognise it as being progressively problematic. Um, and so you, up until now, we hope, we don't know, Taylor Marshall, I think, thinks differently, but we hope that the conclave has been led by the Holy Spirit to find a, a, a Pope who will remedy the defects of his predecessor. And look, we, we always expect, we wondered whether Pope Francis would be willing to leave it to the Holy Spirit. And it turns out that some people in Rome think that he's not willing to. So there are two journalist sources. One is the Remnant TV and the other is the Pillar. And they've been told by different groups of people, they, they tell us, um, that actually the Pope has been getting one of his senior canon lawyers, a cardinal, 
called Gianfranco Ghirlanda to look into changing the way a pope is elected. And they want to do two things, uh, the sources say. <laughs> they want to stop cardinals making speeches and put the whole thing into a kind of secret synod um, process whereby everyone sits down at tables, tells each other how they feel about it and how, how their digestions are working. And then the person who's organising the thing gives a, a, a report back. And by reporting back and not giving people the chance to speak directly, they then, of course, filter everything that's been said and produce what the organisers want said. It's a very old trick. It's been used for the last 40 years in, in, in different circles. And it's a piece of naughtiness. Uh, and, and one of the things it does is to stop somebody speaking prophetically. So if, for example, the Holy Spirit filled the cardinal and he spoke the truth, uh, he could sway the hearts and minds of his fellow electors. And they're determined to stop that happening. The next thing they want to do is to have a whole load of lay people who were uh, appointed by, by the Pope for the Secret Synod to play the same kind of role. Uh, and, and on the grounds this will make it look like the early church. But again, what they're trying to do is to stack the books. Uh, and um, so the question is, how can they make that legal? Uh, and Cardinal Gianfranco Ghirlanda, it was said, have been tasked for doing that. Then the, a journalist said, well, have you? And he said, on my honour, absolutely not. I really haven't. This is all a piece of scurrilous exaggeration. So we all said, well, thank goodness for that. Isn't that that's wonderful news to be really reassured by the cardinal? Because no, none of us want to believe a cardinal will tell a barefaced outright lie to the people of God. But the problem we've got is that the both the Pillar and Remnant TV have gone back to their sources. And they say there's now a huge witch hunt, a manhunt, a secretary hunt, a document hunt in the Vatican to find out who told the truth to Remnant TV. And to the pillar, and as the pillar quite rightly says, you wouldn't have this kerfuffle if something hadn't been told to somebody. So that leaves us with the difficult dilemma of whether or not we believe the cardinal in question. Um, it isn't difficult to imagine the Pope might want to influence the way that the conclave, conclave chooses his successor. And really, much of our sanity and the health of the church depends upon this new conclave. So it's a really big issue. Well, then we need to continue to pray pray about this it's really i think one of the interesting things is the why that we can see a bit more clearly i think coming out of the synod the modus operandi of pope francis and the people who surround him and it seems to me that rather than have a theological confrontation which is going to lose let's face it because you know if you submitted laudato c um, as an essay to any decent theologian, they'd give it a F minus. <laughs> you know, it's rubbish. And it's circular reasoning. It's self-referential, you know, all of these sorts of things. So he's not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> instead, what he's doing is it looks like he's putting the right people in place, doesn't he? Um, you know, obviously, Fernandez is a really good example. And he's hoping that it'll organically, that, you know, that as this becomes the talking point, this is what will organically sort of happen. And Gilanda yes. is really, is an interesting player in this because he's a, a, a I asked someone I know about who knows about, knows him. And he said, uh, so this is what he said, he's a funny old fashioned, old school Jesuit who believes in papal infallibility in the choice of breakfast cereal. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, whatever the Pope says, Gilanda is going to do. And whether he says day is night or night is day, that's what he's going to go along with. And you have to look at the way that these people are being used by Francis to bring about certain outcomes, don't you? One of the things that's happened that we, we didn't announce in, in the introduction, but flows from this, uh, are the dubia that were put to Fernandez over godparents, homosexual godparents and mm -hmm. transgendered uh, baptisms. And I, I read it very carefully, and I, I must say I was very impressed at the skill with which Fernandez constructed the answer because at no point did he actually contradict canon law. But what he did was he presented an answer that that um, showed there were problems and presumed that the problems might go away. Uh, and Card um, Cardinal Muller instead answered Dubia by himself. Now, he has no platform for doing that. But when I read Cardinal Muller's restatement of what baptism was for, and the status of gay couples. And part of the problem with gay couples and baptizing their children is that they procured the child by a way that is, that is wholly forbidden in the Catholic Church, by renting someone's wound and buying a child who's then deprived of their natural biological mm. parents. 
In terms of, of human rights um, and not allowing someone there, denying human rights, you can't, you can hardly do worse than refuse a person access to their biological parents and promote a way of life that does that on the basis of paying for it. So the, the, the business of the way in which gay couples procure their children is highly problematic. Mm. And you're entitled to, the church is entitled to say that of course the child has a right to be received into the church, but not, not in the terms of the way it's being presented. And therefore what you do is, unless you can be sure the child can be brought up in the Catholic faith, which the gay couple are not pursuing, you delay it until it can make its own decisions. So you just delay the baptism. Now, now Fernandez was very subtle in the way in which he answered these things. And then the whole business also of a transgendered person uh, acting as a witness or a godparent uh, without having the the worldview by which they've decided their identity challenged in order to be modified and healed. So Fernandez wants to let everything left alone. We won't ask questions. We'll just presume the best uh, and we won't impose the rigours of canon law. So Cardinal Muller instead wrote this wonderful um, presentation of Catholic truth. And when you put the two things side by side, one is healthy, clean, mm -hmm. true, and, and, and gives us the opportunity of living well. And the other is sly, cunning, mm -hmm. multi-layered, and, uh, and designed to let people get away with as much as they can possibly get away with. And those are the two systems that we have in place at the moment. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, people feel so very uncomfortable about the dicastery for the doctrine of faith and the way in which which um, uh, uh, Fernandez uh, operates. I, I, I've just not recovered from reading his poetry 30 years ago when he talks about the theology of kissing and the problem I had discovering that too many of the mouths he wrote about had moustaches. I really can't get beyond that. As you can call me moustache phobic if you like, and it would be true. Um, but it, it seems to me to be, I don't know, to colour Very peculiar. It's, that's really fascinates me. That I've never seen such a band of peculiar rogues as, as the ones that Francis likes to gather around him. From mm. Marco Rupnik, you know, this serial oh. abuser who got up to all kinds of horrendous, I mean, horrendous sacrilegious stuff. Sanchetta, the guy who was sending seminarians pictures of himself, you know, um, and even going back, I'm trying to think who was the guy who ran Salt and Light TV? Did you, what was his name? I can't remember now. Right at the beginning, he, he was basically the voice of one of the first <laughs> synods, and uh, he found out that basically he'd been publishing loads of stuff that he just plagiarized everything he'd written, basically, was plagiarized. And the only thing he was interested in was LGBT. <clears throat> You've got, um, Monsignor Ricca, the guy who runs Santa Marta, that Pope Francis has put in Santa Marta, who's, there's all this controversy. He's the man who basically Pope Francis was asked about and said, who am I to judge, isn't he? Yeah. So that's the guy who that comment was came out about. And uh, there's this thing that he was locked in a lift with, a, with some young man. <laughs> I mean, like they're just unbelievable, aren't they? All of them. You know, it's just extraordinary. And I think we have to try and keep in context, you know, that this is not the faith, guys. You know, <laughs> it's laughable that anyone is sort of trying. And that's what I can't get over and why I'm so pleased that Archbishop Wilson has put his head above the parapet and said something. No, you know, like Strickland and, you know, the, well, Strickland was so Strickland this morning, the breaking news, it, like first thing this morning, my phone started going crazy because... Um, you know, we there was a, an apostolic visitation uh, to Tyler, Texas. And it was all basically because Bishop Strickland had was involved in, we've talked about this before, but he was involved in some, uh, with Peter Coffin, and there was a guy who was a set of vacantist on there or something like that. And so Strickland had said, look, I'm, I don't think the Pope's, I think the Pope is the Pope. I don't think he's a, you know, fake Pope or anything like that. And he, and he said, that, but I have to say, I disagree with his um, undermining the magisterium. And, you know, obviously that was a bit like, you know, <laughs> should he have said that? Mm. But that I think that's basically what's inter instigated. He, he hasn't been quiet. He's been a very strong voice. Um, we've talked about it many times, and I've written a couple of articles in the Herald about it. Um, 
So he's had this apostolic visitation and we heard recently on the 9th of November that he was asked to resign, um, which he refused to do. And he had said that if he was asked, he was refused to do. So this morning in the bulletino from Vatican, from the Vatican, there was the message that he had been removed as Bishop of Tyler. So, um, and there's um, Joe Vasquez, who's the Bishop of Austin, has been put in as an apostolic administrator. Um, so you have to wonder, you know, when you look at, at Strickland, you've got someone, he, he's known as America's bishop. And when we were in Chicago last April, um, if you talk to anyone in any venue, you know, wherever they are, and you talk about good bishops, Strickland is at the top of the list. He's very much, um, he's got, well, as far as everything I know, he's got a well-run diocese. Uh, they've certainly got pro capita more vocations than dioceses, much bigger than than their size. And that is because people gravitate towards good bishops. So much the same as Wilson has stood up here. Please, God, Wilson's fate won't be the same, but obviously he's he's approached it in a much more politically savvy way, perhaps, than just, you know, saying, oh, the Pope's undermining the magisterium on Twitter. That's interesting, isn't it, in itself, those two approaches. But I think one of the things that makes Strickland so appealing to the people is that he's just a normal, straight-talking guy. And I think we need normal, straight-talking guys in order to bring the faith to people, to evangelise. So what happens to him? He gets, you know, because he's faithful to Christ, he gets removed from office. And someone like Marco Rupnik, we know that the Pope is directly involved with um, exonerating him from his... Um, uh, excommunication he was excommunicated for one of the worst canonical crimes that a priest can commit in the in the uh, confessional and yet that was overturned in a matter was purportedly in 30 minutes and uh, now he's just been incarnated into another diocese and let's get that straight that doesn't mean that he's going to go to slovenia where this bishop in slovenia and he's going to live out his days in quiet he can just be given a pass from that diocese and he can carry on doing what he's been doing in Rome. I think that's much more likely what's going to go on. So the question really is, well, it's going to go mad, isn't it, with Strickland? It's all going to go... Because it doesn't matter what they do now. And, you know, the thing is that dictators make martyrs, don't they? And that's what's happened here. So, you know, we've said before, what's it'd be interesting to see how Strickland... John Henry Weston has got a, an interview with him I think tomorrow coming out tomorrow, so that so we'll get to know firsthand exactly what how the bishop is feeling. But he did um, uh, John Henry did post something on Twitter today, uh, basically saying that he'd spoken to him and um, he's very calm and he's at peace, and he says he wouldn't have done it any different. And I think that's a mark of the man. You know, he is a very uh, faithful, simple sort of a bishop. Hmm. yeah well I think because we know the story and we know how it ends and we're living in it and the bible is the human story that that you've just said dictators make martyrs there's a chart also the other day showing that the the increase in orthodox faithful priests mm -hmm. uh was uh, directly correlated um with in, an increase under Francis so the very thing that you may try to do to quash the things that are holy that are sacred um the clarity most of all i think and I, and, and the, the most concerning thing you've, you've used a few words in the last um few things you've said both of you uh, sly um perhaps devious and unclear we've used the word ambiguity a lot and i think the worst thing most especially for our young people growing up is that lack of clarity and you said we want straight talkers mark that's exactly what we need we need We've all met people in life who, uh, and often I'm afraid, uh, in academia this is this is this comes to us with people who cloak themselves with credentials, um, but they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, and so they they use this to obfuscate. I think, and that's the I think that's the saddest thing is when when you use goodness and truth and what looks like truth, but to slip in lies that's worse than if you were downright you know dressed in this is what peter Kreef talks about when he talks about satan you know all these images of the devil with the pitchfork and um breathing fire and monstrous um it is causes us to miss that actually 
the enemy is very this comes to us as this beacon of light um and comes to us very very attractive and that's that's the danger i think that's the worry yeah that lack of clarity i think one of the things that it does is to show us what the temperature of the conflict is um it's clear that the vatican thought they can get rid of strickland uh, they can, first of all, they send him a signal saying, pipe down, or we, we might get you to resign. And then then once they'd done that, they couldn't back out of it. And he said, I'm not going to resign. So they now forced him to. In a way, this is a very good thing for, if you like, faithful Catholics, because what it does is it sets Strickland free. And if I was Strickland, or if I was a friend of Strickland's, I would say, well, this is wonderful. You could become the apostolic figure in the United States around whom more faithful Catholics can offer their personal allegiance. So whether it's I, I would start something like um, the apostleship of faithful Catholics um, and he could go around and draw people as a figurehead, not to schism. Catholics don't like schism, but to offer to offer pastoral oversight with clear theological articulation of what's going on. In a funny kind of way, I think this could be a very good thing indeed, because what it will do, what we badly need to see done, we need to see the, the demarcation lines between progressive sub-Catholicism or even anti-Catholicism, which is being practiced from the Vatican downwards, and, and authentic Catholicism, which people like um, uh, uh, Strickland have done. I don't understand why Vigano quite went off the rails as he did. He, he might have been that man, but but I think he's gone too far and he's made it difficult for people to act as a leader of the of faithful Catholics looking for an Episcopal figure to give them pastoral and doctrinal inspiration. I think uh, that Bishop Tyler could fulfill exactly that role. And, and if he does, um, I think it will cause some difficulty to the people at the centre because the contrast between what they're teaching and what Muller and Tyler are teaching will become even ever ever increasingly evident. And if Catholics gather around these figures it, it, without without schism, but offering their allegiance and their prayers, then I think it'll it'll help clarify this appallingly difficult process that we found ourselves forced into. Well, I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm off to a book club, um, which is wonderful. I'm going to see my friends this evening and discuss George Orwell's selected stories. Well, I say that, but we'll probably drink wine and and uh, talk about other things. But it's wonderful. Have you read it, Catherine? What's that? Have you read them? Um, yeah. <laughs> now you need to go to confession, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I read one because I've been reading other things, and the one that I've read is the one that we are focusing on so uh, yes hello Caroline and everybody else at book club <laughs> it's nice to do something like this um we need to re-enchant um a disenchanted world and one of the ways in which we do that is um I think through story and good um and myth and as we approach Christmas I've just written for the Catholic Herald about my uh I turn to MR James ghost stories at Christmas time um, it's the only time of the year I'm really interested in ghost stories, but there's something wonderful and he has a, a real sort of Catholic sense, sensibility, although I know he's an Anglican. Uh, but I'm off to I'm off to book club. So uh, that's me. Thank you for watching. See you next week. And that's Mark. And I'm Mark. And let's go. Yeah. I haven't, I, I haven't finished my piece for the Catholic Herald Christmas. I'm completely stuck. So I'm. I'm now suffering from the sin of envy. <laughs> so We're all going need, to confession. <laughs> I should need absolution, confession, absolution, and a bit of inspiration for what I've got to do. God bless you. God keep you until next time.